What's up, y'all? It's your girl, Sakina, and I'm back for another review. This is my review for The Shy Season 3, Episode 3, so let's get straight into it. The episode picks up from where it left off last week. Um, y'all didn't tell me that I was saying old dude's name wrong, uh, fine-ass Nook. I think it's Nook. I think I was saying Nook. Nook. But nobody corrected me, like, sorry. But anyway... You know, Kevin is still like, what's up? I ain't leaving until I find my sister. Nook cocks back the gun. And Jake is like, look, let's just go. Because Kevin is like, nigga, you ain't the first person to pull a gun out on me. But Jake is like, no, nah, let's let's just leave. Let's just go. They decide to leave. And Papa was like, yeah, let's go. Because I'm about to piss on myself. <laughs> it's funny that they came to his house on bikes. Because they left on bikes, of course. And it's just like, oh, y'all some little babies. It's okay. You trying to defend your sister, trying to find her. We get it. And Nick was like, you tough, though. I'll give you that. It's like, nigga, don't be trying to be friendly with me after you just pulled a gun out on me. Get the hell on. Now we see Jada, Emmett, Dre, and Nina. We finally got Kevin's mama name. I had no idea what that lady's name was, which is why I kept calling her Kevin's mama and, and Dre. But, you know, all four of them are going around town, passing out flyers, asking if they've seen Keisha. And everybody's pretty much dismissing them. Nobody has seen Keisha, and they don't really give a damn about taking any flyers because they ain't going to be looking for her anyway. It's really disheartening because it's like, you know, her mom and her family in general is in panic mode. You know, they're scared. They don't know where she is. And then you just got these people who feel like this is not their problem because it's not their loved one or somebody that they know. So while they're passing out the flyers, Nina is uh, walking and she gets approached by Tracy. So they recognize each other and Tracy is like, look, you passing out these flyers is basically dumb really need to go ahead and let me help you. She has a support group. She wants to be all in. She was also trying to convince Nina that, you know, whatever happens, it's not your fault. But that's a more easier said than done type of thing. It's hard. I'm not a parent, but I already know, you know, it's hard for a parent not to feel guilty when something happens to their child because they're supposed to be the protector and whatnot. So it's like, yeah, you can say that, but it's easier said than done. You trying not to put blame on what happened to your kid. It's just like, yeah, girl, don't nobody want to hear that when they're panicking or scared. Now, Jake and Kevin are sneaking out of school. They're going to meet Trig. He out in the street. They want to get Trig to help find Keisha. They know or they think they know that she's in Nook's house and they want Trig to go ahead and go inside to see what's up. Trig is against it because he's like, look, I don't risk my life for people that's not family. Jax is like, hold on, wait. This is my family. I need your help. Him and Kevin get into it, but it's like he comes to his senses because of Imani. I think her name is Imani. I like the fact that she helped push him to, to help Kevin. Like, yeah, you know what? Go ahead and help him. You know, she's giving him those type of nudges. So he agrees to it. Trig pulls up at Nook's house. Now, he knocks on the door, and Nook is just, like, blinded. I guess he's surprised. He had no idea that Trig was there. But I'm like, this is a trap house now, right? So he pulls up. He knocks on the door. Nook comes to the door. They pull a gun out, him and uh, Trig and um, Imani. So they, you know, got him at gunpoint. They make everybody in the house get down. This to me is not a real life scenario. If you in a trap house, you already know your house is hot. You won't come to the door. Not times out of ten, you ain't coming to the door without a gun. People in your house, they're they're gonna be strapped. Basically, they're gonna be ready for whatever is on the other side of that door. Is what I'm saying. And then he was like, Trey was like, call that. And Nook tried to say that Stax wasn't there, but then he was like, once he cocked the gun, he was like, all right, um, Stax, come downstairs and we got company. And it's like, okay, so you mean to tell me that even Stax with the phrase, we got company, he didn't come downstairs strapped? It just wasn't realistic to me. Like, it, I'm not a trap girl, so don't judge me, but I know how the shit goes, okay? So it's just like, all right, this is not realistic. But anyway, Trig and um, his girl, they're outnumbered, but yet they have everybody zip tied and they're looking for Keisha. So they go around the house and they ask one of the girls that was standing around, like, you know, we're looking for this girl. So the girl was like, if she's here, trust me, she's not here by choice. And as they're going through the rooms, 
you can see the girls being mistreated. Um, they're obviously being sex trafficked. Uh, men are paying or whatever the case. I don't know if they're paying or not, but they are sexually abusing the girls. Um, Imani opens the door to one girl being whipped and she ends up pistol whipping the, the guy. Like, nigga, how do you like that? I don't really like to see stuff like that because it's very real. And y'all can see it goes on every day. But remember... Um, Last year, there was this thing that was like heavy on social media about sex trafficking and girls coming out telling their stories. I live in Atlanta, so they were saying that there was definitely um, a lot of sex trafficking activities going on. I actually think that I was being preyed upon um, at a gas station, to be honest. Um, I was at the gas station with my cousin. He went inside and I was on the phone with my best friend and I was pumping gas. This truck pulls up in front of me. He's not, I was at the last pump, so he wasn't even at a pump. He pulls up and gets out on the phone and he's looking at me. Now I'm very instinctive. So like, you know, when I peep shit don't, don't make sense to me or don't feel right, that's when I become really alert. So I'm looking at him. I'm pumping the gas and I'm on the phone with my friend. I'm like, girl, this man is out of the car. Actually, I'm on FaceTime with her. So she she can see. I'm like, you know, this man is around here. And he's just like looking at me. He's not even getting gas. He's on the phone with somebody. He keeps looking at me. But at the time, I didn't even have the idea of what was going on at the time. The sex trafficking thing. Like that wasn't on my mind until after like a day after it didn't dawn on me like he was probably praying on me because it was just so odd and i was like where the hell is my cousin like just ready to get the hell out of there because i had no idea why he was like scoping me out you know what i'm saying so it's it's very real it really got to um trig's girlfriend i think her name is imani y'all i don't want to keep saying her name wrong if it isn't but i think her name is imani trig pulled her to the side when she pistol with the guy and was like what are you doing so you can tell she was very triggered and affected by what she was seeing we almost forgot about papa and his whole maisha situation so he's pulling up on her and he wants to walk her to school because he's like look there's girls that's getting kidnapped i can't have that for you so let me go ahead and walk you to school he was like you know i can't fight but i'm smart so he said that he would do something i can't i couldn't make out what the hell he was saying but he said that he'll get their license plate number too. So it's like, okay, so you're going to get their license plate number after they snatch her up? Like, <laughs> what the hell? What good are you? Because they could easily get out of another car. But whatever, you know, every little detail about a missing person helps. So if you're going to get the license plate number, it's all right. He gives her a breakfast sandwich too. So she's like, what's on the breakfast sandwich? He giving the details and, you know, she, she feeling that. So they walk into school together. Tiffany and Emmett are coming up with this plan to move in with Jada. It's like, their storyline is not flowing to me. Like, I, let me go on a quick rant. I'm sorry. The storyline just does not make sense to me. Remember, Emmett was in a damn basement living by himself last season. All of a sudden, he lives with Tiffany, who is this trap queen who sells weed. And then, what happened to her baby daddy? Remember, I mean, her boyfriend. Remember, she had this gangster boyfriend and she was with him. When the hell did her and Emmett decide to be together? Like, it, their storyline just doesn't make sense to me. And wasn't she pregnant? I think she was pregnant last season too so it's just like what the hell like can Emmett just be single can he please leave Tiffany alone because it just doesn't make sense to me they hated each other so much I know they end up fucking at one time but it's just like now they're in a full-blown relationship and trying to move like why did they move because it seemed like that was pretty stable to me but whatever so they trying to convince Jada to let them move in they're trying to come up with a story that sounds good but they can't even get their story right and jada's like don't try to use that baby as collateral and don't try to sell me no story that y'all don't even have together yes y'all can move in i know that y'all trying to uh start their businesses up or whatever so she was like all right y'all need to leave with that yeah y'all can move in it's some shady shit going on in the city right now so i can use some company but there is some rules don't be doing all that hollering and screaming in the morning um, don't be selling weed or smoking in here. And when she said that, Tiffany looked like she had an attitude. But it's like, girl, do you really think that you was going to be doing that in somebody's house, somebody mama house? Where your mama at? That's the question. Like, where her family at? And no, you didn't think that you was going to be bold enough to be doing that type of shit in my house. Like, no fucking ma'am. But, yeah. So she's setting down the ground rules and she asked them when they need to move in. 
Emmett said he got his friend downstairs with they shit packed in his truck. Don't don't spring no type of shit like that on me, okay? Because that's that'll be the shit that made me change my mind and say no. I'm very helpful. I like to be helpful with the people I love, but don't spring no shit up on me because then that's when my attitude is gonna change and I'm gonna regret saying yes to your ass. Tracy is over at Nina and Dre's house. Uh, she's looking at pictures of Keisha and she's basically trying to convince them to come down to her support group. But she says that it's actually more than a support group. Um, when she said that, she didn't elaborate. So yeah, she says that it's more than a support group. Nobody was there for her when she tried to commit suicide because of the death of her son. Ray is asking her questions like, you know, you feel like you can save us, but the cops can't. How, how, how you gonna do that? Like, what the hell? And Nina's like, look, she's trying to help us out. But you know, Dre is very apprehensive about this whole support group situation. Tracy invites them down to one of their meetings to really show them what they're about. Because according to Tracy, they don't fuck around. There's nothing like a woman scorn, but it's even worse when you have a woman that has lost a child. So they really want to step in and help Dre and Nina, but Dre is not feeling it. She's very apprehensive. Ronnie is still recycling, you know, collecting cans, bottles, and whatevers. And he goes down to the little recycling place to cash in his cans. And Miss Charlene is what we learn her name is. Miss Charlene is still flirting super hard. Listen, she want a piece of Ronnie. She knows that he's homeless. She don't give a damn about his situation. She loves giving back to the community. Ronnie is like, look, honey, I, I'm not down for no pity pussy. And she was like, look, it's better than no pussy at all. He ain't stun her, so he just get the hell on. That woman is real consistent. I tell you that she want her some Ronnie real bad. Jake and Kevin are in school. I did forget to mention on the first episode that I did peep that they was at school together. When Trey pulled up on them, they mentioned that Duda actually got um, Jake into that school. But I would be mad if I was popping like, damn, y'all niggas just left me in public school now. Who, who am I hang with? But anyway, uh, they're in class and Kevin is like, have you talked to Trig? What, what's, what's going on with that? And Jake hasn't heard from Trig just yet. But while they're talking, there's a presentation going on about the French War or the French Revolution, whatever the hell. So the teacher catches Kevin talking and she was like, you want to explain what's going on? Kevin gives his explanation and there's, this girl who actually asked him, does he know how to speak French? Jake interjects and was like, no, I know how to French kiss. And Kevin is like, bruh, stop being rude. He was uh, explaining and the teacher was like, anybody want to elaborate on this? So the black girl saves him and gives this detailed story as to what happened during the French Revolution. Now, Jake is irritated because he feels like she's basically kissing ass and trying to kiss up to these white folks. But she approaches them at the class and was like, look, I need y'all to get y'all shit together. It's bad enough, you know, we already the only black people in the school, so we represent each other. So I'm going to need y'all to be on y'all shit because we have to be phenomenal around these white people, okay? We can't just do the bare minimal or be good. Then she tells Kevin, you're a king. Please stop acting like a peasant. I said, yes, ma'am. Yeah, she is so pretty, little chocolate thing with her afro and her African dangly earrings. Chocolate girl for the win. Jada is down at work and she's seen a patient, basically this fast ass little girl who been getting caught by her grandma. So she's getting put on birth control and the grandma mentions the fact that Jada has a poster of Keisha missing. So she was like, you know, it's sad what's going on with that girl. And the patient chuckles. So the grandma's like, tell her. I'm thinking she was going to say more than what was said, but the girl was like, we used to talk to the same dude. So Jada gives her her business card. Like, if you hear anything about her, please let me know. While they're in the midst of this, some man walks in and Jada's looking like, I know this nigga didn't just walk in here like that. And I was thinking the same thing, like she could have been undressed. So Jada addresses the man just the way I thought. Like, look, that patient could have been undressed. You need to knock before you enter. He apologizes, but it was kind of snooty. And I thought he was a Todd or what is it, Tim or Todd? Whatever the white dude who feel entitled at work, who feel like he doing the most, but really ain't doing shit. When he opened the door, I thought it was a white man, but he not. He's a Hispanic. And he was like, you know, what you want me to do? Like, basically kiss your ass type shit. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. We don't do them type of attitudes around here. You are in the wrong, sir. But he apologizes and he asks to take Jada on a date. 
So she was like, I don't date men that I work with. So then he tries to flip it and says, it's not a date. We ain't friends yet. Whatever. He trying to hit on date Jada and he want to take her on a date. She agrees to it. And you can tell she feeling herself. She going to hit one of these. I'm like, girl, mm. <laughs> he better look better outside them damn scrubs because I wouldn't have said yes. I'm not convinced. Down at Sunny's, Emmett's working and he's wearing Keisha's mission shirt. I'm telling y'all, he love that girl. Like he got a whole t-shirt on at work. And then he getting donations from the people at work with a can of her missing photo. Like, I'm telling you, he loved that girl. They just need to go ahead and get together. But anyway, he get to see Sonny and he's in good condition. He's asking Emmett how he's feeling. He know that they used to mess around and Emmett is holding up. But then Dominique comes in and they have samples on the counter. So she tries some of the chicken while she's ordering. So then she suggests to Sonny that he needs to have buttermilk marinate in his chicken because it'll be juicier. Of course, you know, Sonny is an old man and he been doing this for a long time. So he gets offended. Like, look, I don't need you coming in here trying to tell me how to run my business and how to cook my food because I've been doing this shit before you was even born. Emmett acknowledges her like, what is you doing here or whatever? So Sonny pulls him to the side like, uh, this is one of your bitches. Emmett was like, yeah, I know her or whatever. She can really cook, but... Dominique is basically poking Sonny. He's like, look, keep your friend out of my kitchen. We already know that's going to be a problem in the future. Watch. Emmett pulls her to the side and was like, look, you not supposed to be showing up here during these hours. After hours only. Dom is all up in his face and was like, I thought we was working together, you know, doing all of this flirting and shit. And was like, I'm not one of these girls you used to dealing with. Since you just met him and when you first met him, you was asking to see his penis and you all up in his face. Like, how do you expect to have a successful business when you flirting with him? You all up in his face. You looking like you just trying to fuck. After Sonny's clothes up, they're in the kitchen. They got a line waiting. And I'm like, how are you running a business in Sonny's place of business and you expect not to get caught? Um, That just don't make sense. It sounds good in theory, but somebody is going to mention to him during the day how the food tastes different at night and how they didn't know it was open late or whatever. Like, I just know somebody is going to bring this to Sunny's attention and it's going to backfire on them. But whatever, they got this long line, people ready to eat. You got this man ordering this large ass order, buckets of mac and cheese and shit. And Emmett's like, damn, is you trying to feed a football team? He was like, yeah, actually I am. Dominique is back there struggling because she's a one band man and Emmett is rushing her trying to get this shit done. And she's like, look, if people want family sizes, you're going to have to give me a family staff, okay? She needs help back there. And it's like, duh, I don't know how they thought they was going to run this with one person in the front and one person in the back. We get down to this rock meeting and Tracy is letting the women know that, yes, Nina and Dre need our help. Their child is missing. So we want to go ahead and step in. They have this bitter ass woman giving her little rude commentary and opinions about the situation she feels like this is not a, a search team this is not what we here for people it's just starting to take us serious and she doesn't want to have the organization watered down by keisha because apparently she already knows about keisha and her background apparently the lady's son is somebody they didn't really touch on it but the lady said that she always see keisha and her son's comments and she has a Finsta account. Y'all, is that real? Because I never heard of that before. Finsta. So it's basically like a private, it sounds like an OnlyFans to be for real. But basically that's what Keisha has. And she has all these naked pictures. She's very provocative on there. And that is what's going to overshadow her missing. Once the Rock organization starts to back up Keisha and trying to look for her, they feel like, Everybody is going to pull out these OnlyFans type of pictures and going to be like, okay, well, she's just a fast girl who was out there basically asking for it. And that's not the case. She even goes as far as questioning if she's really missing. Now, Nina already said that Keisha had been missing for seven days. And I feel like that's very rude and disrespectful. The woman said she wasn't trying to come off that way, but bitch, you know exactly what you was doing. So um, there was another woman that was backing up the little bitter bitch. Dre is like, hold on, wait. You talking all that shit, but your son 
had robbed the uh, clothing store before he got murdered. And she was like, we ain't talking about my son. Oh yeah, so now we ain't talking about your son, but you want to try to sit here and make it seem like Keisha ain't missing because of these racy photos that she has. That really aggravated the hell out of me. The nerve of that lady to even do that. Like, I get it, you know, Keisha may have been being fast online and, you know, doing all of this other shit. It just makes me think of how they do black people in the media. When... Someone gets murdered, they want to try to bring out what they did in their past or whatever. They kind of justify what, what happened to them. Like, no, this, this doesn't make sense. And that doesn't have to do with an innocent person being murdered or being kidnapped. Like, it, the two don't mix. So the fact that she even did that, especially as a black woman, it really boiled my blood watching that shit. I was so happy that Dre was getting right with them hoes. But Nina and Dre, they decide to leave because they're like, look, y'all doing all this talking shit about my daughter. Y'all really don't want to help us. Tracy really is trying to convince them to come to the rally tomorrow, but they don't need that type of energy. And I wouldn't either. Fuck all y'all. We get a scene where Ronnie is running with his little cart and he's being chased by a young group of boys. So basically they jumped his ass. For what reason? We don't know. But he's getting beat up in front of a church. So a pastor or this man comes out with a broom and I'm like, you live in Chicago and you think you're about to chase somebody off with a broom? If that wasn't the most old school ass shit that I've seen. <laughs> but anyway, he chased him off with a broom in the boy's room. So he brings Ronnie into the house. Come to find out that's Papa's daddy. That's Papa's house that he's going into. And Papa is like, uh, daddy, do you know who that is? That's the man that killed Kubi. And his dad is like, look, that is a son of God. So we're going to bring him in here. Papa's dad is asking Ronnie you know, what happened out there. And he was like, I'm not really too liked around here, of course, because of him murdering Kugi. Papa's dad is asking, why do you keep coming around here if you're not welcome or if you don't feel welcomed? And he said that this is home. That's what he asked Ronnie, has he asked for forgiveness? And he said that he didn't think so. And he was like, well, most importantly, have you forgiven yourself? Obviously, he hasn't done any of that. But Ronnie stays the night at the house, apparently, because when he leaves, it's daylight outside. But he leaves with like a gift bag of some sort. It was some flowers in there and some other stuff. But he was telling Papa's dad, like, I'm not one for handouts. Like, I want to pay you back. How you going to pay somebody back when you homeless and broke? I don't know. But basically, he already knows where Papa's dad is heading. He wants him to come over into Christianity and join the church. Papa's dad also said, like, you know, I'm not here to force you into coming to the church. Basically, a tour guide for people to help themselves. And Ronnie is open to that. He's like, you know what, a tour guide, I'm very open to that. It's funny because Papa really do look like his TV dad. But um, anyway, my question for this whole segment is, obviously, we know that Ronnie is going to try to get more into Christianity. But what the hell happened with the Common character? What happened to Common? He was supposed to be going over into, you know, the Muslim faith. So I'm just so confused as to what's going on. Like some of this stuff just don't make sense. Where the hell is Common and why the hell isn't he back? Why is it now that Ronnie then went from possibly entertaining going into you know, the nation of Islam, now he's going into the Christianity faith. Like, I'm just so confused with that. They need to make sense of this. Some of this stuff is just is not flowing to me. Ronnie goes over to Miss Ethel. We finally get to see her. Remember in the first episode, she had like an eviction notice on her door. So she's somewhere, I don't know if it's a nursing home or wherever she is. Apparently she has suffered some type of memory loss. He was like, I'm your grandson. And she was like, no, you ain't. My grandson is a military hero and you're a bum. Ah! And he was like, you know, I plan to be a hero soon. And he has this paper in his hand. I didn't see what the paper was, but I'm assuming that it's the flyer of Keisha missing. I was kind of confused though, because once he left Miss Ethel's room, she had a look of worry on her face. Like she knew what she was saying or something. I don't know. It's like she lost her memory, but did she really, or was that an act? I don't know. Tell me what y'all think. I don't know. Emmett goes over to Kevin's house to drop off some food to the family. He's talking to Dre and she is asking him, do you know anything about a Finsta account? And Emmett is like, nah, it's hard for me to keep up with one Instagram account. So I don't really know too much about that. You can tell that Emmett was lying. His face kind of said it all. But he asked about Kevin and how he was doing. So he goes to Kevin's room and Kevin is masturbating to a picture of the chocolate girl that goes to his school. Like, oh my gosh. 
Emmett walks in and was like, oh shit. So he leaves out real quick. But I, ooh, that is so embarrassing. Like you, you can't even finish the job at that point because cause you're just all thrown off. So there's a scene with Emmett and Tiffany. They're arguing early in the morning while Jada is asleep, waking her up. So she comes out to see what the hell is going on. And they arguing because Emmett promised to take the baby to daycare but he's too tired to do so. So he wants Tiffany to go ahead and do it. She's like, I'm going to be late for work. So I'm not trying to take him to daycare. And he was like, girl, you sell weed. The weed man is always late. And she's like, well, I pride myself on being on time and yada, yada, yada. But it's like, girl, you really out here acting like you got a nine to five. You can drop him off on the way to your customer's house or whatever the case. Like, it was just weird to me that she's like this this weed girl like don't get me wrong there's nothing wrong with it but it's just like like i don't know i just don't like tiffany so y'all already know it's just like ugh, girl shut the fuck up so jen is like look i'll just take the baby to daycare because neither one of them listening they still being allowed in her house and tiffany has an issue with that because she feels like jada is always saving emmy and basically that's why he's trifling so i'm like how hold on wait how the hell you gonna try to check me about me and my son in my house. You a homeless hoe. Don't try to sit here and play me or try to tell me about my wrongdoings and raising my kid. Girl, go get your own house and then you can do whatever the hell you want over there. But you over here, I'm trying to help your black ass out. So she leaves and Jada is trying to tell Emmett, stop being sorry for certain shit. Just do right. And you need to start off doing right by telling Dre and Nina about that Finsta account. I know you got her MySpace passcodes. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. That's some shit that my mama would say. Like, girl, what? MySpace ain't even popping. Like, what are you talking about? But she was like, yeah, I know you got all her passwords and stuff. So you need to go ahead and be honest about that and give that information to her parents. So he writes it down and Jada gives it to Dre and Nina. And they appreciate that. So then they go through her account. They see all of her racy photos that the women at the support group was talking about. And Nina is upset. But Dre is basically trying to defend Keisha's action. Is like, you know, she lost her dad suddenly. She's just seeking attention from other people. Nina is like, I give her all the attention that she needs. Girl, you already know a parent's attention and a man's attention is two different things. Dre is just trying to defend her, you know, like, look, it doesn't matter if she had a man's penis in her mouth. Like, that does not take away the fact that she's missing. So, Kevin's mom is in her feelings, and she goes and says that Keisha is my daughter, not yours. And, of course, that hurts Dre and was like, I knew you was going to pull this shit. I knew that this day was going to come. You are a glutton for punishment. I told you we need to do more research before going to that rock meeting. And I told you that we don't need to look at those pictures. But here we are. Don't take that shit out on me, though, because I'm not having it. And I'm like, that's right, Dre. You need to put your foot down. I really like Dre's character. She's very logical, very reasonable. I like those type of people. So she's a very realistic character, and I really vibe with her. I like the fact that they're incorporating her more into this season. Despite what Dre is saying, Nina still wants to go to the rally because she feels like she deserves to be there. And I agree with that because that is her daughter. Why not show up to something that's supposed to benefit your daughter? Both of them need to be in attendance. Trick me up with Kevin and Jake to let them know that they did pull up at Nook's house, but... Keisha wasn't there. So Kevin is like, did you search every room? You know, he wasn't there. So he wants to make sure that it was thoroughly done. But Trig is like, yes, I put a gun to this nigga's head. Like, I would think that he would tell me the truth. So then Trig was like, she been gone for a week. She's probably dead. And that pissed me off. I don't like people like that. You have to be optimistic. And if you feel that way, you still shouldn't say that to somebody's family member. And you already know how worried they are. Jake was like, she ain't dead. I feel it. And Imani was like, I feel it too. And she told Trig, don't say that. Speaking of Imani, we get a scene of her and Trig at the house. They're smoking. And she's like, you know, I keep thinking about those girls that we've seen at that house. That could have been me. That's very true. It could be her. It could be any of us. You know, any female, God forbid, but we're not exempt from anything. She really wants to help the girls. But Trig is like, look, some people have different paths in life. Basically, that's theirs. But she's not trying to hear that. And I wouldn't try to hear that either. Like, she wants to save them. But he's like, um, where the hell are they going to sleep? Where the hell are they going to eat? Like, you can't save everybody. Trig just wants her to focus on the situation at hand. 
which is getting Jake. So then he starts singing. And y'all know Luke James, he can really sing. He's a great singer. I love his voice. So he starts singing to her love ballad. And I love that song, y'all. Y'all know I'm an old soul. So I really have a love for classic soul music. They start playing that and I was in my feelings. I have never been so much. Come on, y'all sing with me. In love before <laughs> I know y'all be tired of me singing. I'm sorry. I just can't help it. But while the song is playing, we get these scenes of everybody, you know, trigging Imani slow dancing. Papa and Maisha, you know, he giving her her books as she's walking home from school and she give him a kiss on the cheek. I said, okay, come on, puppy love. And then you get Jada and her little Tomas, her little Latin lover. He greeting her outside of her job and asking her to come in the car. You know, it's just real cute. Everybody real cute and in love. But all of that is stopped once we see Kevin at the house. He's in his room and he's thinking his mom is trying to convince him to come down to the rally for Keisha, but he's very reluctant to do so because he's fearful that she may not be alive, but his mom gets him to come down there. Down at the rally, everybody has come out to show their support. Jada asks Dre why she wasn't on stage with the rest of the moms and Dre was like, because I'm not Keisha's parent. We know her feelings was hurt by what Nina said at the house. But Tracy is leading the speech and she's basically saying everybody should be losing sleep over these missing girls because it wasn't just about Keisha. They also had posters of other black girls that were missing in the neighborhood too. So, you know, she's like, these are all our children. We should see our children and all of these girls. So Nina gets to the mic and she's giving her speech, basically saying that Keisha is no angel. She's just a teenager trying to learn. You know, Nina was the same way when she was her age. But she was like, you know, help me find my daughter so I can basically show her the way to go. Now, Ronnie is in attendance and he's down there listening to the speeches, but he's glancing into the crowd and he sees this white man. Now, mind you, this is the only white man in the crowd. So he sees him and the white man makes eye contact with Ronnie. And then he tries to scurry off. So Ronnie is going through the crowd trying to catch up with the man, but he loses him. Obviously, this is somebody that has something to do with Keisha being missing. This is it's very odd because, like I said, he is the only white man in the audience. And then you look real suspicious and you're running off once somebody realizes who you are. These type of people do tend to do that, try to go out to see what people are saying, what people are doing to find the person. You know, basically just having that ear to the streets to see how they should move. And it's scary because he could have very much so went back to the place and killed Keisha. You never know. But Ronnie is on to him. And this is what's basically motivating him to find Keisha. But that was the end of the episode, y'all. I really did enjoy this episode more than I've enjoyed the other two. It does seem like the season is going to start picking up from here. Uh, the previews of next episode look really good. And that's when our girl Candy is going to make her debut. You also get Tia Maury's husband, Corey Hardwick. I think that's his last name. Don't, don't come for me. But yes, I'm interested in getting more into Imani's character. She really grew on me this episode. So I want to know more about her. And by the way, um, I was looking at all the previews for what's coming on on Showtime in August. And Showtime has a really good lineup. I think I'm about to check out the two shows that they had showed. It was one called Love Fraud. And then it was another with a black man. I think he was from England or he might have been from France. It was like a detective type of show, but whatever. Their lineup looks really good. Y'all need to check that out if y'all haven't. But yes, y'all, thank y'all so much for viewing my video. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.